Good afternoon. This is Roy Oppenheim for Oppenheim Law. This is our 11th segment of Zoom at noon, uh, which we started literally 11 weeks ago uh, when uh, COVID-19 was just uh, beginning to uh, come into our lives and trying to figure out how we were going to be dealing with, with this new existential threat of, of sorts. Um, I want to thank, of course, those people who've been putting this together with us. Uh, Paolo Vergara, who puts these presentations. Good afternoon. This is Roy Oppenheim for Oppenheim who puts these presentations uh, together with us. And of course, uh, Lance Oppenheim, our, our son, and then my partners, Jeff Sherman, and my wife and partner, Ellen Kowalski. Uh, today's topic is 10 things you and your business can do to remain relevant and solvent during COVID-19. Next slide. Um, we're gonna be focusing today on, on literally 10 things. One is some the Zoom trends that just transforming uh, the way we relate and, and deal with each other which companies are out and why, which companies are doing particularly well and why and how we can do well too if we follow their, their, their strategies, uh, how insurance is gonna be a very important aspect of what, what we do going forward. And of course, asset protection, how we protect our assets as we're trying to go out and do the right thing, but at the same time, there are risks and how do we shield ourselves against those risks. Next, of course, is liquidity. How do we stay liquid? Where do we get cash from? How do we... Uh, organize our, our personal finances as we're, we're trying to, uh, to move forward uh, individually as a business and as, as a society. And then competitiveness, how do you remain competitive? What gives you the advantage, the edge over, over your competitors? And then contingency planning, how do we deal with the fact that yes, things are opening up, but at the same time, there will be bumps in the road, we'll take one step, two steps forward, and there will be steps backwards, we all know that. There will be probably new peaks, new valleys, new hot spots, and we're gonna all have to modulate our conduct to figure out how to get around these mines, these, these, these mines of sorts. And then how do we reinvent ourselves? How do we re reinvent business? There are some people who are good at it, some people need to be nudged, but those who don't reinvent themselves will end up going the way of Hertz Rent-A-Car. And then of course, reinventing your finances, how do you protect yourselves, uh, again, in terms of your overall gestalt of, 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 of your, uh, your family's uh, business and, and, and wealth. Uh, Zach Shillamith is gonna be joining us uh, at the bottom of the hour. He is a good friend. He's uh, been involved with, with bankruptcy for many years. And a lot of this has to do with, with bankruptcy planning, not just filing for bankruptcy, but how do you prepare yourself so in the event that you do have to file for bankruptcy or you can use the threat of bankruptcy as you're negotiating with creditors. So move forward, please. Again, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, and there are some new folks who, have, who are joining us, and thank you for joining us. We're also streaming for the first time on Facebook Live today. So for those of you who are like saying, what is this? Just to give you some background, 11 weeks ago, we started this, this Zoom at noon to kind of take people through this whole process, where we we're going, what's around the next curve, how to deal with legal as, as well as personal and social and business matters as we try and figure out how to navigate this. None of us were alive the last time this, this type of crisis happened. The only thing that came close was the mortgage foreclosure crisis, which we were intimately involved with and we're at ground zero. And that's when, when uh, our, our blog in the trenches began literally 10 or 12 years ago. And we ran these kinds of seminars for people. Little did we know that that was literally a dress rehearsal for what we are dealing with, with today. And so, we're here to kind of navigate ourselves and all of us through this process together. And as, we, and as a community, we will, of course, get through this. Our firm was founded in 1989. We, we serve various local, national, and international clients. We have over 75, 80 years of, of collective experience. And we, we focus on real estate and business and, and commercial litigation. And uh, it's, again, our honor and pleasure to uh, be serving you all today. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, in terms of our team, Jeff Sherman, as I mentioned, is our, my partner, Mia Singh, senior, senior associate, Ellen Kowalski, my wife and partner, who has been very uh, involved with, with these Zooms at noon and, and, uh, on the, and the vaccines, making sure that we stay on topic and I don't get too boring. And then Paula, again, as I mentioned, and then Zach will be joining us at the top of the hour, at the bottom of the hour. Okay, so let's get going. So at the last session, we, uh, there was a discussion about the three tenets of going back to business, uh, liability, insurance, and asset protection. This week, we're going to further our analysis on how to make our comeback a success, a success story, remaining relevant as well as solvent. Bill Gates may have said it the best right now. If we make the right decisions now, informed by science, data, and the experience of medical professionals, 
we can save lives and get the country back to work. I know there's a lot of political noise out there and we're hearing a lot of things from our, from, from our politicians and elected officials. And of course we have to discount a lot of that communication by what the folks who are not necessarily elected, not necessarily elected, but those people who are there to do their job and give us the right information. And it's tough to get the right information. So we have to look at all the different sources and distill it. And that's one of the things that we do every week is we're, we're looking at lots of different information and trying to distill it back, back for you all. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to share this picture. Uh, I think I, it came off someone's Facebook page and I kind of loved it. Uh, and, and specifically, it's, it's a Georgia Tech football game. And uh, it was 1918 during, during the Spanish flu. And as you can see, the games went on and, and people protected, protected uh, themselves. One of the things I did want to mention is to make sure that uh, if you have questions, and that's really a very important part of this process, it's an interactive process, again, for our friends at Facebook, please ask some questions and, and make sure that, that we get them uh, so that we can be responsive. Also, if you have some ideas on what topics you'd like to hear about in the future, we'd love to hear from you too in, in, that, in that regard. Next, please. So these are some great uh, uh, graphics that, that just were presented to me this morning. In fact, they were presented to me by my father-in-law just a few hours ago, and I just think they, they're absolutely fan fantastic. Uh, these are requests for directions on Apple Maps uh, versus uh, January 13 baseline. And as you can see, uh, the yellow uh, is walking, the blue is driving, and public transport is red. And as we can see, uh, with public transport, there have been very few requests uh, since uh, the beginning of COVID uh, for public transportation directions. Yet after a steep, steep fall on driving and walking instructions, we're getting back to uh, a little bit back to what it was before um, the, uh, the, the, the crisis, but certainly not there yet. But we're seeing an upward tick on driving and walking. The big issue is going to be public transportation. And it's, and it's really ironic because, you know, we've all been pushing for public transportation answers uh, in big cities and, and, and to give up the car. And yet it's the car that is that at this point is becoming the winner in, in this whole crisis. Not only are we shopping, you know, are we picking up our groceries at, with cars, we're going to drive-ins with cars, and uh, we're, we're using our cars as offices. The car has become an extension of our home, of our bubble, and it's, it's quite, quite fascinating. Uh, next slide, year-over-year -year changes in TSA airport screenings. Well, it speaks for itself. We all know what's going on there. Uh, at least it is flattened out and we're starting to see slight increases. But it's going to take, you know, as we've said, three to five years to get back to where we were in terms of, of the types of air, air flying that we were doing. And it may never fully get back, but, but it, last time around after September 11th, it was three to five years. Uh, next slide, please. Weekly U.S. hotel occupancy rate. And the good news here is after the great fall, we're starting to see a, a, a bit of a, of, a, of a U coming back up slowly but surely. So, so the good news is people are starting to figure out what to do. And the hotels are figuring out how to keep people safe. And as the confidence builds, a hotel occupancy rates will continue to rise. Year-over-year uh, -year change in U.S. restaurant reservations. Well, we can see that huge, huge steep drop. And then we're seeing a flat line. And now we're seeing uh, some slight resurrection of, of, of restaurant reservations. Obviously, people are opting to eat outside more than inside, which makes sense for the time being. But, but restaurants are doing all kinds of, of things to try and make you feel safe indoors. Thanks. Year-over-year -year change in single-family home mortgage purchase index. This is critical. It shows you the kinds of uh, mortgage applications that, that, are, that are transpiring. We're seeing a, a, an increase now in mortgage applications. Interest rates, interestingly, have, have not dropped as much as they should have. Uh, I, there, there's a reason for that. Banks are concerned. They make these, these mortgages that there are still going to be moratoriums that are going to be imposed upon them. Uh, further, uh, they're concerned about people's jobs right now, and so that's holding back mortgage applications. But it is the mortgage market that historically, the real estate market that historically takes us out of the doldrums, and I definitely think that with interest rates low and, and such few listings on the market right now that we're going to see real estate being uh, the engine that's going to drive us out of, out of this crisis, as well as, of course, the consumer. Some trends. Uh, Zoom trends. I mean, we're seeing uh, everyone is is probably ODing on Zoom right now. We're using Zoom right now. At the end of the day, we're just Zoomed out. But it is interesting uh, how uh, we have transformed the way we communicate. I have a friend the other day that used to go to these conferences and would spend a boatload of money going to a conference to see certain presentations. And those same presentations are now done in an hour and a half in a Zoom call. He didn't have to get in a car. He didn't have to go to the conference. He didn't have to pay for hotels. Uh, of course, he misses that social interaction, yet the information that, that he was looking to garner, he was able to get through uh, a Zoom call. And I've, I've personally experienced that also, and it is quite fascinating. Uh, next slide. Uh, more interesting uh, issues on Zoom. Uh, uh, all businesses are gonna have to, you know, 
apply the technology and be capable of using it and make sure they don't get frozen, have to improve their internet connections at home. Uh, backgrounds are, are being are the new waiting room, bookcases, uh, it, it, well, not this guy's bookcase, but bookcases typically are, are, are becoming a sign of some sort of credibility, especially you see that on TV. Uh, video, is in, it, video is the in-person use, using of, 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 of video is an in-person is in person using a camera. In other words, uh, we're basically s replacing the camera and our visual uh, presence uh, with uh, what it would be like to have a personal interaction. Of course, the personal interaction isn't exactly the same, but it seems to be working for, for the time being. Folks are going to have to invest in training your workforce on, on these platforms. So what, who's in, it, who's out, and, and, and who's in, and why? Okay. Uh, this is fascinating. The day the giants uh, fell at the same time, and, and Zach, when he, when he joins us, may want to comment on this. But in 08, 09, we saw there were 271 bankruptcies of, of companies that were that, that had $50 million or more uh, in liabilities. And uh, as we see the white um, one on the right over here, uh, that one is 2020. There have already been 78 large bankruptcies, uh, and that is almost equal to what we would see like in, in 2006 and 2004. And uh, thus it looks like we may be approaching uh, something close to 2009 or may even exceed 2009. We have great companies like J. Crew, J. C. Penney, Hertz, CMX Real, uh, Cinemas, Avianca Airlines, Frontier Airlines, Borden and Aldo. Uh, but all these companies, interestingly enough, were, were at the verge of of being unsuccessful already. And, and Hertz, for example, I don't want to pick on them, but on the Wall Street Journal article, they kept buying cheap uh, uh, cars, four-door cars, instead of SUVs. When, when the market wanted SUVs and people wanted to rent SUVs, they kept uh, purchasing uh, cheap sedans. And the great irony was, you know, had they bought uh, what the market wanted, yes, they would have paid more, but they would have been listening to their customer. And so I think here the most important thing is you need to listen to your customer. And when your customer tells you something, they're giving you free advice. They're telling you what they want. And all you have to do is figure out how to give it to them. The hardest thing in business is to figure out what your customer wants and how to do it, how to deliver it, and do it in such a way that it's both effective for them, good for them, and profitable for you. So companies uh, that have filed for bankruptcy were struggling before, as we said. Uh, uh, those struggles were connected to inability to change, to adapt to consumer behavior. Online demand, of course, has been devastating for retail. And uh, this pandemic has accelerated the speed of the fall. And so what people are saying is that while there were already trends that, that, that were existing, we have just accelerated those trends. The move going in, into home, you know, to working at home and telecommuting, that trend already existed before COVID. It's just that we are now accelerating that process. And, and maybe the car is one area that, that there was a trend where people were saying, well, I don't want a car, I want to use a Lyft or, or, or Uber. And, but now owning your own car, that trend I think is, is, is bucking maybe a trend that previously existed. But most trends and most companies' success or failures were a function of, of what they were doing right and wrong. Before, before COVID. And Amazon would be a perfect example of a company that was doing something right next. Agility, okay. So those individuals and those companies that are agile are, are, are going to be the most successful. Um, I do know that there are a number of individuals who uh, I've met who uh, are now delivering food uh, for some of the large companies, whether it's Amazon or, or Whole Foods, um, or they're using any one of the delivery services, and they were previously in the cruise industry. And while the cruise industry is, is, is down, instead of waiting for it possibly to be picked up, even though they were furloughed, these individuals now are, are, are working for these large companies and, and delivering food. And so those individuals who are, who are gonna pick themselves up and, and quickly uh, rock with the times are gonna be those that, that, are, that are gonna be successful. And it's not just individuals who are gonna be like that. The companies that, that, that have that kind of spirit and mentality, of course, are also gonna do just as well. So focus on the local, your community, the suppliers next door, the next door community bank. Take a look at those old ideas. We're going back to basics. Still, we want good products at home. Maybe something that did not work before could be your saving grace. Experiment with what you know. This is not the time to be a jack of all trades. It's also a time to take your expertise to new levels and offer your services through new channels. Search for new company, companies. Do not shy away from new technologies. All those predictions about the future, remote connections, driverless cars, robots for everything. They are, they're here and it's happening. Rethink your business accordingly. Um, you know, it's funny because before this crisis, I was giving a, a, a seminar on the impact of the driverless car on real estate. And we were looking at and what impact that was going to have on, 
on parking, on garages, on office space. And so many of those things that we were talking about are now gonna accelerate much faster than we anticipated because of, of the work at home phenomenon. Uh, one new business that, that seems to be very popular right now is instant cocktails from the bar. Uh, play, uh, place a frozen mixer in a glass and add liquor. A lot of uh, bars are, are actually selling the, the, the mixers and then you add your own liquor and you, and, and you um, actually leave the place or vice versa, you bring your own, own mixers and they add the alcohol. Um, and so that, that didn't even exist, you know, two or three months ago for the, for the most part. Um, insurance, let's talk about insurance. So whatever business you have or even individually, you need to be looking at your insurance policies. And of course, we, we'd be glad to do that uh, and, and assist you with that process. There are different kinds of insurance for different businesses. Obviously, the most important insurance that you should have is liability insurance. So if someone gets hurt, someone gets sick uh, because of something that you've done, uh, you want to make sure that you have coverage for that. Uh, one of the things you're going to have to look at carefully in your insurance policies are exemptions. And so a lot of policies, especially the business interruption policies, do have exemptions for, for viruses and pandemics. Some do, some don't. Uh, so from the business interruption side, there's a lot of potential litigation out there uh, as it relates to, uh, did your business get interrupted and was it interrupted by COVID? And if it was, was it caused by the pandemic? And then the question is, is the pandemic covered by, by your policy? But in terms of liability, if someone, if you have a restaurant or if you have a beauty salon and someone gets sick, A, can they prove they got sick because of you? And of course, if you have a hot spot and all your employees and a bunch of your if your customers get sick, I think there'd be an inference, a strong inference that, yeah, they got sick because maybe you, your employees weren't, weren't careful enough. But to the extent that does happen, to what extent do you have liability insurance that will protect you and your family and your assets and make sure that the business can continue? The other big risk right now is cybersecurity breaches. During this uh, viral environment, we just don't have a, a physical uh, virus that's affecting us as humans. We also have viruses that, 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 are, that are spawning now on the internet. And there are these uh, folks who are obviously trying to take advantage of, of people's uh, weaker security at home to, to break into companies' uh, security. And so you need to have cybersecurity uh, uh, insurance as well as make sure that your cybersecurity uh, with the folks who are telecommuting and working from home are, are at a level that, that will protect you and, and your business and, and therefore your, your family. And then the other thing, waiver of liabilities and notice of assumption of risk. Right now, a lot of summer camps are, are contemplating reopening. Uh, many summer camps, uh, local day camps, are going to reopen in, in Florida if, if the trend continues on the reopening. And, and there are very complex uh, waivers uh, and assumptions of risk uh, that, are, that are going to exist. We, we talked about, I think, uh, two or three weeks ago, how the assumption of risk is becoming comparable to the assumption of risk of when you go skiing. You, you, and skiing is deemed to be an inherently dangerous sport and that you assume the risk if you're going to get hurt. And so it's kind of ironic that simply sending your kid to day camp has become effectively almost an, a, a, a risk uh, that, that is inherently dangerous. I mean, who would ever think that sending your kid to, to day camp could be inherently dangerous? But in this time of COVID, there are some risks and the question is who, who, who has to garner that risk? I mean, the mere fact that they open the business, do they, do they incur that risk or is that a risk that you as a parent are willing to take to give your kid the cultural uh, experience of of day camp. And so those are the questions that, that both the legal system and our society as a whole is going to have to grapple with. But if we keep everyone at home until this is over, uh, the theory is that, that you know, there, there'll be more people who are going to get sick and more people are going to die because people aren't going to go to the doctor or the dentist and do those things that they need to do to stay healthy. And so we have to maintain this equilibrium, this balance between opening our society, yet maintaining social distance and, and to the extent possible, wearing, wearing mask where, masks where, where it's appropriate. Next. So let's talk about asset protection because that's one of the things that, that we need to talk about. So if you own a business or if you have, if you're doing something as an independent contractor, you want to make sure that number one, if something goes wrong, that your personal assets are not at stake. So the first thing you obviously want to make sure is you have good insurance. So the first thing we have to do is evaluate what insurance you have. Make sure if you're a professional that you have errors and omissions insurance, or if you're a business that, that you have liability insurance. And of course, also if you have employees or even independent contractors, that you have workers' comp insurance. Because if you don't have workers' comp, you, your business can be sued uh, directly. Um, and yes, and in fact, we, we, I've just been told, I, I forgot that we have some questions that, that are coming up and uh, uh, we, we need to go to those, if I may. Um, I forgot where they are. Thank you. Uh, first question, do you have an up, 
dated will? And, and this is an important question, and let's see what people have to say about that. Okay, so, so three quarters of you do not, and, and I would um, you know, highly suggest that, that if you have some downtime that you pull out your old will, if you don't have a will, you call us and, and we have a, a wonderful team of, of lawyers who, um, who really uh, actually specialize in, in trust and estates, and uh, some of them have been on before, and, and so you've, uh, you've had a chance to meet them if, you, if you've been on these, um, on these webinars in, in the past. But, but it is something that I would highly, highly recommend. We go to the next question. Uh, before you title an asset, um, like a car or a business, with whom do you speak with? Do you speak to your accountant? Do you speak to your lawyer? Or do you speak to no one? Okay, so uh, probably half of you are, are speaking to no one and either you are a lawyer or an accountant and you know what you're doing or you just don't think about it. But typically when you go to the car dealer, you know, they're not asking you, uh, you know, what entity or individual should be uh, leasing the car or buying the car. But it's really important that you don't have like one spouse owning the car and the other spouse driving it because if something goes wrong, both of you are going to get sued. And so if you're leasing the car, you know, the question is, is, is the person driving the car the person who's going to be leasing it? Uh, and if not, you know, these are the kinds of things you want to want to look at. If it's going to be a business vehicle, are you going to put the vehicle in a in, in some sort of entity so that the whole uh, enterprise isn't at risk if something goes goes wrong with, you know, there's an accident. Of course, insurance is the best answer to this, but, but that's only one layer of protection. The other thing is, I don't know how many of you have heard of umbrella insurance, but umbrella insurance is something that, that provides you additional uh, liability protect, protection. Um, I don't know if anyone's been asking any questions, but I, again, I invite you all to, uh, to, to ask any questions or, or make any comments uh, with anything that, that we've previously uh, talked about. Uh, and then loan protection. If, if you are borrowing money, the question is, uh, who's going to borrow that money? Is it going to be the entity? Is it going to be you as an individual? Is it going to be you and your spouse? Um, and what assets are going to be uh, attached to to that loan, and that's really critical right now because there's a lot of a lot of loans out there, whether it's the PPP or the EIDL or or other other advances that, that you can negotiate with with your banks. Uh, but because there is a fair amount of money that, that has come through the CARES package from from Congress, uh, you need to be cautious how you, you you take that money and if you're guaranteeing it and and what those terms are. And again. An accountant and a lawyer are the best people to talk to to, to, to talk about those risks and, and figure out how it works with, with your, your greater family family assets. And then the, the next point is, uh, how are you characterizing your investment in your business? Debt, is it secured by UCC or, or, or paid in equity or both? These are important distinctions if, if you file for bankruptcy. I don't know, is Zach, is Zach around already, uh, Lance? Because if he is, this is a perfect time to have him join us. He may be there. Let's see. Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, let us keep going if we can. Uh, we have a question. Let's do this from, from uh, Elizabeth. You mentioned in the past that it's better to lease than to own a car due to the liability. Can you clarify that, please? Sure, of course. So when you get into a car accident, and again, you have insurance. So this is, let's say, the insurance fails or there isn't enough insurance. Um, the personal injury lawyer is going to sue the driver and the owner of the car. Again, a car is deemed to be like a dangerous instrumentality. And so the owner of the car is going to be responsible for whoever they, they, they let drive the car. Now, if the owner of the car and the driver of the car are the same, well, that's easy. But let's say, let's say the spouse owns the car and the husband drives it and the husband gets into an accident because he was speeding. Uh, then both the husband's going to be sued and the wife's going to be sued because the wife gave the car to the, to the husband. And, and, and so they both are going to be sued. Now, if you are leasing the car, then the owner of the car is going to be Toyota. It's going to be Honda. It, it's going to be Volvo. It, it, they're going to be the owner of the car and you're going to be leasing it. And so the only party that's going to ever get sued is probably Honda or Volvo or, or whatever and the driver of the car. So from that perspective, leasing is better. Now, from terms of, of, of mileage and, and expenses, that's a whole different thing. And then you have to review that with your accountant. It really depends how many miles you're putting on. The great irony right now is that people who've been leasing cars and were using, used to commuting to work, they're not putting those miles on their car anymore. And so leasing may become a, a, a great way to reduce your car expenses by leasing a car that only has 10 or 12,000 uh, miles a month on it, as opposed to 15,000 or 18,000, because that gets very expensive. But in, in the answer to your question, uh, leasing from a liability point of view is typically a, a better situation. 
as we proceed. Uh, let's go on to liquidity. So uh, cash is king. And by the way, I'm going to ask this question, even though it, it's not there. I guess we can't ask it. But I was going to ask you all if you all knew what restaurant this is. Uh, but I'm, uh, if anyone wants to just write in a the comment, they can, they can tell us. But this is a, a restaurant. I'll give you a hint in Fort Lauderdale. And they are doing whatever they have to do to stay open. Uh, they uh, have been around for a long time. They're very reputable. But as you can see, they're, they, they're sending out a message that they're going to uh, be involved with doing whatever they have to do to keep their, their clients safe as, as they proceed. In terms of capital investments, uh, you know, probably this is a good time to borrow. Oh, someone figured that out real quick. Okay. Uh, someone said uh, uh, Casa D'Angelo, and, and that, is, that, is, that is correct. Um, uh, in terms of capital investments, business are going to look where they're going to get capital and, again, how they're going to structure that capital. And, and that's going to tie into uh, the types of debt that they're going to take on and how you title that debt and how you protect your assets is, 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 is really very, very important. Um, in terms of guarantees, I want to go over this, which goes back to the car question. Do you have any personal guarantees uh, for a, a lease, a car, leases meaning like, like, like a residential leases, cars, business, family members or none? Well, this is great. People, most people have, have no personal guarantees. Oh, no, some do. Some are guaranteeing some stuff for their family. There's some leases. Um, so about 10% uh, or 9% are, are, are leasing and, and have some, some obligations. Car payments usually are personal. Those are really hard to get away from. 13% businesses, only 6%. Family members, 6% and none. So, so guarantees are, are, are difficult because when you, you, you own a business or, or you're doing anything else, those are obligations that, that could extend way beyond uh, just the, the, the life of, of the business. And so you want to be very cautious about uh, what you're going to personally guarantee. And, and one of the tough parts about doing bankruptcy planning is, is that sometimes uh, while you can take care of the business, if they're personal guarantees on a lease or, 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 or some sort of business equipment, those guarantees will, will, will extend beyond the life of, of the business. Um, unemployment in progress. Uh, what percent of those unemployed are likely to return to their long line of employment? And the, the choices were 15%, 25%, 40%, or 50%. What percent of those unemployed are likely to return to their line of, of, of employment? And we have 15% may return, 25%, 40%, 50%. And most people think about 25% will return, or and the others are saying half. Right now, the, the and only 9% of you said 40%, and, and right now, that is the estimate that, that about 40% will be able to return back to their, their line of employment and will then have to become agile and figure out uh, what to do. And, uh, but these are all just speculations, but you know, it's not me who's suggesting this. This is what uh, you know, pundits are and, 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 and economists are, are, are suggesting. Next, okay. Contingency planning. So businesses must prepare for having the quarantine repeated in six months or maybe again in another six months or having more quarantines. We just don't know uh, what's going to happen. It's probably going to be more of a local phenomenon and maybe more of a phenomenon up north as, as uh, flus historically and viruses historically do worse in, in cold and, and, and drier in environments and people are indoors a lot more. Uh, but having said that, we, we have to be prepared for that. We have to be prepared for folks from New York and other parts of the country coming down to Florida and bringing the virus with them. Uh, and so what you need to have on hand uh, as a business is to make sure you have cash, you have an in, your inventory, your technology, and a clear plan for your people and, 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 and true leadership. But you're going to have to be nimble, you're going to have to be able to adjust, and you're going to have to be able, just like almost hurricanes, where, where we're used to every year having to, uh, to deal with hurricanes and we've become very used to it, it could be kind of like that for the next year or two, where, where we open, we, we, things look good, and then again, uh, you know, it's going to be two steps forward and maybe a half a step or one step back. I think we have another question. Then you can look for Zach again. What can seniors do to protect their estates? Um, you know, there, there are a number of things, and I'm, and I'm glad someone asked that question. Um, the reality is there are three things that we can, we can expect after COVID. And again, this isn't just me. This is, this is really, I think, universal. And, and one is uh, we can expect taxes to increase. The reason we can expect taxes to increase is because uh, there's going to be more government debt. So you can expect more debt. You can expect taxes to increase. And the third thing, which is obviously fascinating, is you can expect very low interest rates. So those people who you know, historically have been buying bonds or relying on, on, on uh, CDs are, are gonna have difficulty with that. And so they need to really 
prepare themselves for those three tenets. Again, that is government debt, higher taxes, and low interest rate environment. So if you proceed with those three things, you will be able to, to figure out and navigate yourself. And the other fourth thing, which is clearly, is that when you have more taxes, the first thing you do is you tax the people who don't vote. And that is unfortunately the states. So if your state is too large, there's going to have to be some flattening of your state or you're going to end up paying or your, or your heirs are going to end up paying more taxes than they ought to have because you didn't do proper estate planning. The good news is you have a year or two to figure this out, but those are the three things that you're going to have to consider. And there is Zach. Hi, Zach. Hello. Sorry I'm late. How you doing? Uh, Fine. Again, Zach Shalomith is a great bankruptcy lawyer. He's a good friend, and, and we work very, very closely together. And uh, Zach, tell us the types of stuff that you've been seeing out there since you were on a few weeks ago. Um, I'm still seeing seeing a lot of calls from <clears throat> from small businesses. <clears throat> I think I think people are more focused on on the issues that their businesses are are, are facing right now uh, rather than. Uh, individual bankruptcy uh, questions, but I know that that's going to start coming once the businesses get stabilized somehow with with what needs to be done from a legal basis and a financial basis. Um, getting a lot of calls from from businesses who are concerned what to do with their landlords. That's probably the biggest uh, section of of uh, calls that I'm getting are, are tenants, uh, but um, still a, a lot of small businesses concerned about what to do. And how do you see bankruptcy playing into the landlord tenant relationship? Um, I, I think bankruptcy can be an excellent tool for, for tenants to use. And, you know, I know we talked about before, uh, and, and we'll talk about it, I assume, in a little bit, the, the, new, the new bankruptcy law, the new bankruptcy law specifically for small businesses. Uh, but what I'm about to say is actually available for small and large businesses alike which is a, a, a bankruptcy can help a small business, um, save a small business from an eviction. And what a bankruptcy can do for those tenants is buy time. And uh, it can buy a lot of time. And there's actually a, a lot of cases going around all, all across the country right now where judges are struggling with the issue of how much time uh, can be given to, to businesses in dealing with their landlords. And some judges are being more flexible and some judges are recognizing that under the bankruptcy code, there's certain deadlines and what do we do with those deadlines? But the bottom line is it's an excellent tool for tenants to buy time uh, to save their businesses when they're facing eviction. Right, and, and, and the reality is, is that uh, if you don't file for bankruptcy, you will be evicted very quickly once the moratoriums are lifted in the next few weeks. And it's unclear if the governor is going to keep the moratorium going and assuming he doesn't, uh, there will be a floodgate of, of, of evictions, both residential and, and commercial, and that's where bankruptcy is going to become absolutely critical to buy you that critical time. Let me just ask you, on a residential side, do you think it would buy you some time too? Because I figure it would, you know, maybe a, a few months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, bankruptcy can, can, can save someone from being evicted from a, from a residence as well. Yeah. The important thing, and, and Roy, you and I talked about this, uh, you know, offline before, is timing. And, and it's important that bankruptcy can help both a person and a business from eviction only if it's filed before there's a final judgment of eviction. So, uh, and that's a lot of the calls that I'm getting, which is the, the you know, bankruptcy can help, but when must I do it? And, right. and you have to be very careful on the timelines because so, so, someone might wait too long. Right. So let me, let me emphasize this. And I know this, we, we hit you with a lot of information and some of it just can glaze over you. And I, and I apologize for that because it, we we're, we're just hitting you with so and so. But if you take away one thing today, if you can't pay your rent, whether you're a tenant, uh, residential, or if you're a commercial tenant, you can't wait till after the judgment is entered by the court. The time you would contact us would be A, when you get that three-day notice, and that's either tacked on the wall or it's sent to you by certified mail, but you kind of know when you got the three-day notice. At that point, you need to probably contact us. And then sometimes the, the landlord's just playing a little game of, of cat and mouse with you here, and you don't know if they're really gonna file. But then you have to be served. And when you get served by a process server, and you're served without eviction, you then need to do something very, very quickly. And you need to pick up the phone, you need to call your lawyer, and that lawyer then needs to file for bankruptcy. Once that bankruptcy is filed, as long as that judgment has not been entered into, you have stayed 
the proceeding. You have pulled the jurisdiction away from the state court, and now you are in federal court. And so that's why it's so critical. And you know, I probably have now said this four or five times, but there are new folks on here. We're streaming on Facebook Live for the first time, Zach. Uh, and, and so it's important for people to know when they can assert these rights. It, it is just horrible when someone comes to you or it comes to me after the judgment's entered, and we've had that, you and I, uh, and, and the, the, the entry is the order's already been entered, and now they want to file for bankruptcy. It is too little, too late. We have some questions. Let me see what I can do here. Is filing a declaration of domicile a uh, form effective in Florida for residency purpose? Does it matter if it's a six month rental or 12? I, I, I'm not sure I can even answer that question. Do you, you understand that, Zach? I don't. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, the Declaration of Domicile is not gonna provide you, if it's a rental, you don't have homestead rights, it's not gonna provide you anything. It may provide you some, some benefit as it relates to another state and your obligations for state income taxes if in fact you've declared yourself uh, to have Florida your domicile, but the other state is still gonna look at how many days you physically were in that state versus in Florida to determine if you are subject to the jurisdiction, the tax jurisdiction of that state. Next question, is having a Delaware single member LLC owning a Florida LLC or doing business in Florida enough, uh, enough protection. So is having a Delaware single member LLC owning a Florida LLC doing business in Florida? And, and I'll, I'll let you talk about that, but you were talking about a single member LLC here. So what, what, what do you think, Zach? Yeah, I, I think that type of company would be eligible to file bankruptcy in, in Florida uh, because it would be doing business in Florida. There, right. there, there's a lot of different things that can bring venue here. So that would be enough. My only concern was that under Florida law, if you have a single member LLC, uh, that may have may, may be pierced through the, the, the one single member because single member LLCs typically are not deemed to be true LLCs uh, and they're deemed almost, almost like sole proprietorships. Now, if it's a, a Delaware law, we could have conflict of law, but if you had like a single member LLC and you were your own LLC member, and you have a car that's, let's say, in that LLC, and you think you're protected, so you don't even have insurance because you think you're protected by your single member LLC, point number two, you should take away, get a lawyer, you're not protected, speak to Zach, speak to me. Uh, okay, should we, uh, oh, then we had one other question. Uh, when, when it, when, where and when should someone use umbrella insurance? Zach, do you wanna, you wanna address that briefly? Umbrella insurance. You know, umbrella liability coverage, I mean, um, and the answer to that is that it's always a good thing to have. It's not yeah. expensive and it gives you peace of mind and literally it is an umbrella and, and it protects you if, if there's some catastrophic loss beyond uh, your, your underlying uh, liability policy. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Lance, if we can, please. Uh, keep your business going may mean both growing and shrinking. And I, I think, uh, Zach, you're gonna be seeing that where uh, you know, th th those companies that, that can pivot, you know, they're the ones that, that are gonna be able to, uh, to survive this. Uh, you gotta do more with less, uh, at least for now. And uh, you know, you're gonna have to hold, you know, keep your powder dry and spend money carefully and adapt on the fly. You, know, you cannot plan every contingency. You just have to have confidence and faith in yourself and your team to be able to, uh, to make, make things fly. And then your employees, you know, they need to have your trust, you need to have their trust, and, and you need good leadership within, within your organization. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think that's, that, those, are, those are really important takeaways. Um, what do, what do you, anything to add to that, you think? No, those are, no, those are really good takeaways. Um, how to remain competitive. Let's talk about this a little bit. Um, you know, to survive, I think we talked a little bit about, you know, the business must angle to position themselves, you know, to serve during the, the pandemic. You know, it isn't just about making money, but, but to build your brand and, and build trust in your, in your community. Uh, if you look at the average ads that are, that are out there right now, they all or a lot of them begin with, uh, you know, during these unprecedented times, we're here to, you know, assist you. And, and I think that resonates with, with many folks, you know, giants like Target and Dunkin' Donuts, uh, in fact, have registered their pandemic slogans uh, and they're directed to emphasize their, their commitment to, to their clients. And, and businesses that are likely to survive are engaged in the business of problem solving. And so they're finding their hurt, they're finding what, what, what the need is and they're filling it. And uh, there are gonna be a lot of new businesses that evolve as, as for every business that, that probably you know, collapses, there'll probably be one or two new businesses that are going to fill that void. And it's kind of like a purge it's in, and it's, 
just a, a way of, of our society re reinventing itself. And uh, is it good? Is it bad? It's not for us to say, but it is what it is. And so, uh, you know, that's what it is. Uh, reinventing your, your business. Uh, the CEO from Piedmont Bank uh, recently said, uh, Wendy uh, Kylie, uh, companies that are surviving, some indeed growing, are the ones that have pivoted either within their existing business or to a new line of work. The ones who have a single source of revenue have more challenges. So those people who are you know, figuring out that they have customers, they have clients, but what they were serving them before may not work now, they still have a client base and they just have to offer them something that their clients, clients really want. Uh, this goes hand in hand with agility and, and flexibility. This is a, a cute picture of sorts. Uh, did, you, uh, uh, did you used to only offer only one service? Well, you have to re reassess that. Uh, these are times for exploration and creativity. Uh, flexibility uh, reassures people about the continuity uh, of, your, of your business. Uh, rethinking expenses and, and spaces. Again, uh, real estate, commercial real estate is, is, is going to be turned on its head. Today I was hearing that actually higher end office space may do better because they may actually service the needs of their clients as it relates to providing a more secure and safe environment as opposed to uh, office spaces that are, that are not necessarily A or A minus spaces or B or C spaces where, where they're, we're never envisioning to provide a certain level of service. And so we may see that people are gonna take less space but wanna remain in a, in a building that, that is gonna provide the sense of, of safety when you, when you walk into a building. And so that's gonna be very interesting to see how, how that, that flies. Uh, uh, Evan uh, Spiegel from Snapchat uh, said the other day, people want certainty and there's a huge amount of, of pressure as a leader to make definitive statements. I think it's important that we remain flexible in a situation that is changing rapidly. And so we have to plan to basically expect the unexpected. And we can kind of anticipate what the unexpected is now since we've gone through this uh, and we're in the middle of this right now. And that is that there could be shutdowns. There could be folks who have to, again, you know, shelter at home. Uh, there are going to be government restrictions and recommendations and people don't feel comfortable doing certain things. And so we have to work within that gestalt. We have to work within that environment. And once we, we adopt that environment, and once we're, we're, we're in the current, we can swim with that current, even though it wasn't the current that we were planning on, on, on following up, up until now. Uh, and this is fascinating. I think this is a, uh, it might be a Lufthansa flight, uh, but they've converted major parts of the, uh, of the passenger uh, area to, uh, to storage for, uh, for, for freight. And uh, here you have an airline just reconfiguring its purpose. And while these were, this used to be passenger seats, it's, it's now being used for, for air freight. And so, uh, you know, is your business plan still relevant? You know, uh, what are your marketing outlooks? Are they still relevant? Uh, is paper advertising close to dead? You know, have you revamped your web presence? Check your social media. Uh, do not borrow on, on, on hopes. Uh, and then of course, the real question is when, when to call it quits. Even, even for law firms, how are law firms going to get their clients in the future? You know, how, they can't necessarily do in-person webinars. They can't, can't take clients out for lunch. They, they can't go to mingling events or, or other kinds of events. So, so is what I'm doing here, is this it? Is, is this how we, we're supposed to get our clients? I don't know the answer to that. I do know that you know, 12 years ago, when people were in a crisis, we provided this service and we're naturally providing it again. But, but it's kind of an interesting question of how even, even, even my profession is going to figure this out. And, and, I guess we'll, we'll figure it out together. Uh, Zach, I want to talk a little bit uh, here about, uh, you know, the legal toolkit, toolkit of, of bankruptcy and, and how, you know, people should do a lot of pre-bankruptcy planning with their family assets, the titling of assets, and, and not just calling us, you know, at the last hour, but to call us weeks, months, maybe even a year or two in advance so they can, they can position themselves. And, and let's talk about some of the look back periods because that's really what, what's critical to, to planning here. Right. Yeah. It, it's um, in, in any type of bankruptcy, any type of bankruptcy, the bankruptcy trustee or the creditors can look back essentially four years. Now, certain disclosures need to be made about transactions that take place within two years. And there's even different, uh, different time frame on transfers that are made within one year that are in repayment of debts to family members or friends. So it is very important before if you're contemplating or, you know, you know, business is contemplating making any type of transaction or repaying any type of large debt uh, or doing anything major to, to talk to us ahead of time, because that could have very significant impact, uh, impacts on a future bankruptcy. Even a bankruptcy that you're thinking may not take place years in the future, 
the time to discuss these transactions are now. I have people who uh, call me and they say, remember we spoke a year and a half ago about you know, the possibility of filing bankruptcy and, and you gave me some advice, well, I'm ready to file now. And, and that's the right way to do it. And, and the great irony is that many businesses that are filing for bankruptcy never contemplated filing for bankruptcy. And so had they done the estate planning, the asset planning and the bankruptcy planning, all in anticipation of not filing for bankruptcy, but just in the case they were going to file for bankruptcy, would probably be in a better place. And let me assure you that these large right. companies, by the way, is Hertz rent car going out of business? Yes or no? <laughs> um, I see different, I see different, different, uh, I think yes. I mean, but- They're going out of business. I, I think they're just gonna, you know, restructure their debt. Their, their shareholders are gonna get screwed and they're still gonna be in business, yeah. yet they're gonna be smaller. They're getting rid of, uh, luxury vehicles to rent. They're going to, you know, eventually start renting, you know, uh, cars that people want, and they're probably going to be more efficient and maybe they'll be acquired, but, but whether yeah, they, yeah. And, and so my point is, is they have been doing bankruptcy planning for probably years. Oh yeah. Yeah. For them, this has been a long time coming, I think. Right. Um, and, so yeah. And, I guess and, so, we'll have to see. Right. and so the difference between them and the Nordstrom's or, or or, or a Neiman Marcus who are, and, and I meant more Neiman Marcus because they're, they're in bankruptcy or about to go. They've been bankruptcy planning for five years. I mean, they've been, I, mean, I, mean I, I always thought they were in bankruptcy. When are you finally filing? But my point is small and mid-sized businesses and, in, and even individuals need to have this worst case scenario plan in place. Hopefully that you will never use it. But the irony is, is we have a tail event here. And so bankruptcy planning is a kind of tail event plan. And so the best thing to do is do that kind of planning. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't kill you. And you should have it in place. So if, in fact, you have some sort of, I mean, I mean, next time it could be a tsunami. I mean, next time it could be a tidal wave. Next time it, it could be a comet I mean, uh, or, or an asteroid. I mean, who knows? I mean, these are all 100-year right. events, 500-year events. Uh, but, but the point is, why not plan for something insane and crazy so that when it does happen, you say, well, you know, I had a plan and, and it's not going to take me completely down. And so uh, a lot of businesses, I think, did not do that. I mean, I mean, they weren't planning for this type of existential event. And, 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 and lawyers, by our very nature, are always planning for the worst. And that's why people don't like us. It's because we're saying, what if? What if, you know, you know, and we're always like, you know, the big pessimist in the room, you know, we're the 900 pound gorilla, but that gorilla once in a while is going to be right. I mean, just like a broken clock is going to be right yeah. twice a day. And so in this particular case, I think that we're learning that this kind of planning for a small or mid-sized business or for individuals when they're, you know, should have an estate plan, they should have asset protection and they need to particularly have it, as I said earlier, because estate taxes are going to go up and interest rates are going to drop and there's going to be a huge amount of government debt. And so you need to plan your life around those three clear uh, indicators of what is going to happen when we come out of this. And so uh, I think it behooves anyone to have a, who has a business to sit down with a lawyer, a bankruptcy lawyer, uh, whether it's Zach or, or, or me or Zach and me together. Uh, and we talk about uh, what needs to be done and what the rules of the road are so that you can figure out how, when you get out of this, you don't make the same mistake again. I do have some clients in all candor, you know, who went bankruptcy last time and their, their, their plan is to go bankruptcy, to go bankrupt again. And maybe that's the best plan. But the point is how nice it would be if you didn't have to do that every seven to 10 years. You know, I just think it would be nice. Right. Uh, let, let's just talk briefly about the difference between a seven and a 13 and an 11, you know, without getting too into the weeds, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So chapter seven is a liquidation and it's available for businesses and individuals. Uh, a chapter 13 is a reorganization. It is only available for individuals. It's a personal bankruptcy. And then I think on the next, uh, the next slide is uh, the chapter 11. That's right, yeah. So chapter 11 is a reorganization. It's available for businesses and individuals, both alike. And there is a new bankruptcy law available for small businesses. Uh, it is, un, it's the Small Business Reorganization Act. It was actually enacted in February uh, before all this happened here in the United States. And it, it, it came at an opportune time because it's going to really help a lot of companies and individuals who are affected by, or are being affected by uh, COVID. Uh, and you can see it from the, from the slide. It's, it's less expensive than traditional Chapter 11, greater leverage, streamlined procedures, faster process. Essentially, it, it's, it's, it's very similar or somewhat similar to a chapter 13 for individuals where the business um, pays what it can 
and, and really we, we do a budget and the business pays what it can to its creditors. So that, that's the main takeaway is that it's, it's flexible and it helps businesses pay what it can when all the creditors have their hands out at the same time, it helps the business survive. And the nice thing is the creditors can't veto the plan like they ordinarily could do with a, uh, with, with, with a historical chapter, chapter 11. And then they say, ah, this, this business is never going to fly. We want our money. Goodbye. And that, that isn't the case with these, with these sub. Right. Chapters. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest change. That's the biggest change. Right. Uh, we have a few more questions here. Uh, when will you feel comfortable meeting with clients in person and are the courts open? Uh, you know what? I think the answer is when the courts are open, I'll probably feel, feel comfortable meeting, meeting uh, with clients. When, when a court is open and is willing to impanel a seven or 11 member jury in, you know, sitting next to each other in a, in a room that doesn't have open windows. And when they allow, you know, 10, 20 people in an elevator, you know, in a 25 story building, uh, I think that's when we're all going to feel comfortable. But right now, uh, the courts are, are not physically open. They're not uh, impaneling uh, live juries and they're not letting more than one and they're not going to let one or more than one or two people on an elevator, even even when when the courts do reopen. So the answer is that I think we'll take our our, our, our marks from from the court system. And, and we've historically always done that. And I think we're just going to follow what the courts do and the courts feel comfortable and the judges feel comfortable. You know, I know a lot of them personally, then we'll probably feel comfortable, too. Next question. Is there a limit on how many times an individual can file for a Chapter 7 bankruptcy? There's no limit on how many times cumulatively uh, an individual can file bank can file chapter seven, but uh, you can only get a discharge of every eight years. So if, if you needed to, you can file a chapter seven every eight years and get a discharge. So it's every eight years. Okay. Another question. Isn't your credit and goodwill hurt when you file for bankruptcy and how do you overcome this negativity? Well, from a commercial, you know, from a corporate point of view, you know, uh, you know, Jay Crew is in bankruptcy right now, but they're ordering, offering 40% off right now, you know, and I think people are looking at it, oh, they're in bankruptcy, I'm going to get good deals from them. So I think it works the other way. Then when people know they're in, in, in bankruptcy, you know, you run to the store. Same thing with Barney's. I mean, you know, they had great sales when they were going bankrupt, but Barney's went out. I mean, they're gone. But, but I think Jay Crew is probably going to remain, you know, they're probably going to, you know, get out of all their retail stores. They're probably going to be more of an online uh, type of company. They may have some one or two big stores, maybe, uh, you know, it's flagship type stores like Apple did in New York when they, when they started, you know, they had one store or two stores in, in, in California, New York. And then, but, but my point is, is that I, I think um, it doesn't hurt your, your credibility from a corporate wise. And individually, I would take the position that you can get more credit when you file for bankruptcy. What do you, what do you, what do you say to that after you file for bankruptcy? Yeah. And, and, and as far as, as far as your credit score, you know, people who are filing bankruptcy don't, are, not in, are not in financial health to begin with. So my clients that are filing individual bankruptcy cases have lawsuits. They're, they're late. So their credit is already bad. We're not talking about people with 800 credit scores who are all of a sudden out of nowhere filing bankruptcy. There, there's a problem. Bankruptcy fixes the problem. And most of my clients, they actually, once they emerge from bankruptcy, they have a better credit score than they did before because their credit was already bad because of all these problems that existed and that are now fixed. Right. This is a question. I'm going to just read it and I'm just going to, and the mere fact I'm reading it, people will know that, that this is a hard, hard question. If one of the homeowners gets sued and they own the home as joint tenants with right of survivorship, one of the owners has homestead, uh, will the home be okay? Are, or are all the owners at risk now? What can the other, other owners do to protect themselves? Uh, well, I mean, the reality is that it, it could be too little too late because, you know, you, you have a, a fraudulent conveyance issues and fraudulent conversion issues. The, the homestead protection may help one. It may help both. It depends on the relationship. I mean, there, there are numerous issues. And that's why we talk about how titling is, is, is so critical. The question is, was this title properly? If the law, if the suit's been filed already, you can't start transferring assets uh, because that becomes a fraudulent conveyance or a fraudulent conversion. A lawyer would need to analyze very carefully the circumstances here to come up with an answer. And so that's why this question is a perfect example of why it is complicated to, to do planning. And so maybe these people should have done planning ahead of time. Maybe they did. Maybe, maybe things are okay. I, I just don't know the answer off the top of my head. And I don't think anyone did. Another question is, do you deal with Medicare planning for seniors who need to structure uh, their assets. I know Wayne Patton of our office, uh, you know, who does estate and asset protection planning, you know, does Medicare uh, planning. I've always had mixed feelings about doing medic. Actually, it's Medicaid planning. It's not Medicare planning. So whoever wrote that, there's a big difference. Uh, there is no Medicare planning. It's Medicaid planning. And uh, 
Again, I, I don't necessarily believe that it's the right thing to deplete your assets and get rid of all your assets so you can end up in some, some lousy COVID-19 nursing home that's gonna kill you. you know, I just don't think that's, that's really the right thing that, that someone should do uh, in their life. And I think people are gonna reassess Medicaid planning to try and deplete yourselves to go into some sort of place that, that doesn't provide the proper protection. And I bet if you do an analysis, Zach, you're gonna find that a lot of these places were Medicaid facilities uh, uh, that, that where people died because they just didn't have the resources to get people out and, and, and provide the proper protection. So, right. so uh, you know, I would think twice about doing Medicaid planning after, after COVID. Uh, do you deal, okay, uh, that may be it. Let me see, do I have one more slide? I just did this one. Thank you. Um, I think we have one more slide here. Um, anyway, is there another slide? Uh, Okay, I, I do want to ask uh, one one question of everyone, and that is, uh, and maybe someone has the answer to this. You know, what is the most important thing that a business should be doing right now? And 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 what is the second most important thing that a business should be doing right now? And the answer is they need to survive. I mean, that's really the answer is they need to stay in business, do what they have to do, and, and do what it what it takes. Uh, Okay, here's one more question, and then we're going to have to call it quits. Can you please explain what are the options to homeowners that are in the forbearance plan with lenders? And so um, I'll, I'll take this answer. It, it, it's complicated because, first of all, it depends on your bank. It depends if, if uh, who, who holds your loan. Is it a government-sponsored entity that holds your loan? Uh, it also depends... Uh, on your relationship with the bank, and if, it, and if it's a first mortgage or a second mortgage, is it your primary residence? But, but typically you're getting uh, three months forbearances, and every three months you can call the bank and get another three months. And, and if it's a, it's a government-sponsored loan or a guaranteed loan, you can do that for, for up to one year. Uh, and then supposedly those, those loan amounts are supposed to get tacked on to the end. There may be some banks that are gonna try and collect that money up front, and they may put you in, in bank in foreclosure. And if they do that, we may decide to move them into bankruptcy and then sue the bank back for, for doing something illegal and, 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 and bringing a, a contested bankruptcy. And so those are the kinds of things that, that may happen here if, if the banks, uh, again, uh, go off the rails. So far, we haven't seen that, but certainly from the lessons we learned last time, that would be one strategy that I would, I would recommend. And, and Zach, you can chime in on that and then we gotta call it quits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I, I would add is that if, um, if these forbearance plans call for a large lump sum in month six or month 12 and, and and the lenders are not being uh, forgiving in extending that, what a chapter 13 bankruptcy could do is there's a plan called a cure and maintain plan where you can cure the arrearages over a very large, over five years. So instead of having the payments due all at once within in month six or month 12, you stretch it out over uh, 60 months where you're paying the regular payment and you're also curing the arrears on top of all the other uh, items that, that Roy mentioned that, that the lenders might have a claim against them because of what they're doing. Right, and, 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 and we could then bring an adversary proceeding in, in, in the bankruptcy court. So, right. so those are gonna be options. Um, I wanna thank everyone again. Zach, thank you as, as always for, for joining Thanks us. For having me. Uh, Roy Oppenheim for Oppenheim Law. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to help you. This is week 11, we'll see you again week 12. And if anyone has some topics that you think we should be discussing that we're not addressing, please, please send us a, a, a real quick note before uh, we, we go off. And uh, thanks again, Roy Oppenheim for Oppenheim Law. Zoom at noon. Zach, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thanks.